Hey guys, Paul here once again with VHSCollector.com here to bring you another VHS review and today we are talking about Regal Video's 1987 release of Satan's Touch. Now for anyone who's familiar with Regal, they started about I guess the early 80s with four big boxes, three of which were horror, one was a martial arts film. Then they went to the clamshells. Most of their releases are clamshells. I think they have about 40 or 50 releases and then towards the end they released slipcases like this so this is one of their last slipcases now I think Regal's still around actually they deal with independent films and I've actually looked them up before I actually emailed them years ago asking if they would want to do an interview about their old video releases I don't even think they emailed me back let's look at the cover here because these Regal videos have such awesome artwork I've always been intrigued by their artwork and most of them look like they've been done by the same artist what you see here is a woman who looks I guess possessed she has these red eyes like a demon and she has blood dripping from her mouth there's also that inverted pentagram that's on fire right totally looks like an exorcist or evil dead ripoff the tagline reads the evil is everywhere so of course this is in the horror aisle this has to be a horror movie um, it just reminds me of something like the exorcist of the evil dead certainly let's read the back Jim Parrish makes the unfortunate mistake of defending the work of the devil. As a reward from the Minister of Evil, Jim is given a trip to Las Vegas, where all he could lose is his sanity. He is caught up in a bloody war between good and evil, and forced to witness sadistic and bloody tortures, and the use of chemical weapons which can turn a man into a monster so grotesque that the devil abandons him. Totally sounds like a horror movie, right? So what exactly is this movie? Is it horror? Is it something else? We'll delve right into that. Now, this is pretty obscure on IMDb. It has 22 votes and three reviews. Uh, that's another reason that intrigues me so much about it is that it is pretty obscure. And if you go on the IMDb page, it only lists the cast and the director and writer, which are the same person, but it doesn't list any of the other crew members. It doesn't list the DP or the grip or the audio guy. It doesn't list anybody else. So it's always been quite a mysterious movie. The film begins with Satan explaining to the viewer how much he loves Las Vegas, despite people being mostly the same everywhere. To prove his point, he sends Jim Parrish, a grocery store owner from a small midwestern town, to Las Vegas by granting him the winning ticket of a church raffle. Meanwhile, we are introduced to some of the ruthless characters behind the operations of the Las Vegas casino Jim soon visits. When Jim arrives and begins gambling, he realizes he's on an incredible winning streak. Although he is only making a few small bets, it's enough to catch the attention of casino security. While playing, Satan pops his head in every now and then to remind us he's the one who's causing Jim to win. While this is happening, the head of the casino, named Joe, realizes that a slot machine programmed not to pay out anything is missing $3. He hires a private investigator named Sylvia to figure out where the $3 went. He also puts her on the case of Jim Parrish, and she goes undercover as a fellow gambler to figure out his so-called system. Joe becomes so obsessed with finding out how he's winning that he sends a hooker to Jim's room, hoping to secretly record footage she can blackmail him with later. The plan fails, and all Joe gets is footage of Jim and the hooker eating breakfast the next morning. Frustrated beyond belief, Joe asks Jim to go home. Annoyed and confused by the whole situation, Jim agrees. At the same time, Sylvia discovers that the $3 missing from the slot machine went directly into the bank account of Tony, the head of casino security. On his way out of the casino, Jim bumps into a fellow gambler he met at a table. On a whim, the two decide to fly across the country to Atlantic City to continue gambling. Most people would think Joe would be glad to see this guy finally leave his casino, but hell no. He actually has Sylvia follow the two men to Atlantic City for the sole purpose of figuring out Jim's so-called system to winning. While there, Jim bumps into Sylvia and strangely doesn't seem the least bit surprised by this. She's then notified by Joe back in Las Vegas that Tony is on his way to Atlantic City to kill her because of what she knows about him siphoning money from the slot machine. Joe, still obsessed with Jim, decides to fly there himself with a few of his men. This whole time, I'm thinking, why doesn't Joe, the owner of the casino, just stick behind and have his men bring Jim to him? It's this last half hour of the film where the plot seems to just fall apart into a convoluted mess with glaring plot holes. In fact, the choppy editing makes it feel as if chunks of the film were pulled out. Poor small town Jim now finds himself mixed up in a whole ridiculous murder plot. When Tony arrives, 
he chases both Sylvia and Jim across a discotheque until he is hit by a lethal dart from one of Joe's men. Following this, Jim, for some unknown reason, agrees to play a poker game with Joe. I guess the point of the game is for Joe to figure out how Jim has been winning all this time. Hey, I guess the boss knows what he's doing, but... He knows what he's doing. Look, if we can simply play poker with this guy, we're going to learn a lot about him. If Joe has some ideas to when he's telling the truth and when he's lying, well, that'll provide a lot of insights into the guy. Scared to death of Joe, Jim begins to lose on purpose. This insults Satan, and he no longer helps Jim to win. By the end of the game, Jim loses everything. As a weird sort of constellation prize, Joe allows Jim to go home with $5,000. By the end of the movie, I'm left wondering, what was the point of all this? So there it is, guys. As you can tell, this is not a horror movie, not by any stretch of the imagination. I guess the entire marketing gimmick for this movie is the fact that the devil's in it, but he's barely in the movie, and he's not even scary. He's some white guy with a perm, and once in a while he gives us some line that I guess is supposed to be funny, which of course isn't, so I just find it incredible. It's like, what were they, <laughs> what were they thinking? I would love to be inside the regal offices where they were all sitting around the table and deciding, how are we going to sell this movie? This movie isn't scary at all. We'll just change the title. That's all we have to do. We'll just change the title to Satan's Touch. And the original title of this movie is actually Jackpot, which is more appropriate for this movie. Uh, but I guess, oh, the devil's in it. Let's call it Satan's Touch and we'll put a scary woman on the cover. And we'll just change, you know, we'll add some really crazy stuff on the back. The whole second paragraph, or the, or the second portion of this paragraph on the back is a bull-faced lie. And it's funny, because when you read it after watching the movie, you realize how incredibly absurd it is. I'm just going to reread some of this. He is caught up in a bloody war between good and evil, and forced to witness sadistic and bloody tortures. That's not in the movie. What are they talking about? There's no bloody tortures, and he's not forced to witness anything. And the use of chemical weapons, which can turn a man into a monster so grotesque, what is that? Is that the, the serum that they use to knock people out, like in the movie? I don't, it's crazy. I would, that person should be fired, but of course, Regal wants this. They want people to pick this up at the video store, read it, and be like, oh, well, I gotta see this, I love horror movies, and then be like, you know, what just happened, <laughs> right? And I can't imagine this being great for the video store, right? Like, why would the video store continue to buy Regal titles if their patrons, their video store patrons, are complaining that the synopsis on the back isn't true? Because this isn't a horror movie. I wonder if, how often that has happened. Not just for Regal, but for other companies. I remember Magnum Entertainment did that release of The Night After Halloween, which was another bold-faced lie of a cover. And Magnum Video, Magnum Entertainment, was a much larger distributor than Regal. So I guess if they think they can get away with it, they'll just do it. Or maybe they just don't take these, you know, low-budget movies that seriously. Maybe no one will notice or no one will care. Whatever. But um, I can imagine if I had a video store, I'd get all kinds of people coming in and saying, Dude, this is false advertising. The packaging is just lying to me. It's almost a fraud, essentially. When you're paying for one thing and getting another, isn't that like fraud? Or I, It's not really embellishing when they're talking about bloody tortures, that's not in the movie. <laughs> so, um, it has to be some kind of fraud. I don't know. I just find it fascinating that all oh, these companies got away got away with it for so long. So now that we know what this movie is not, what exactly is it? So, it feels like a drama movie that is supposed to, you know, have some moral message about gambling, but it fails at that miserably. Because by the end of the movie, our guy just ends up going home with $5,000 more than what he had in the beginning. So it's not like he lost all this money, but then he realizes at the end, you know, it's not all about money because you still have your family, right? No, he goes home with $5,000. So what is the moral message of this movie? That you can gamble and take five grand home at least with you? Like, I don't understand. I do feel like he was trying to tell a moral message, but I think it just got caught up in this very convoluted plot. I don't get it. It's just, it's just a mess of a movie. Um, and what's also interesting about this movie is the music. It had music made just for this movie. And I'm not talking about a score, but music with lyrics that have like a pop feel to them. And um, one of them is called Jackpot, and another one is about Las Vegas or Atlantic City. <laughs> Great to be home in Atlantic City. I've seen them all, I've been gone, but no place turns me on like Atlantic City.
you do get to feel that this movie is probably a labor of love for the director because it must have had a decent budget because a lot of it was shot in Las Vegas and across the country in Atlantic City and Minnesota, the home state of the director. So there must have been some money for this to move the, the crew around. And it's not just in the movie where they say, oh, we're in Atlantic City. They actually are in Atlantic City because in the credits, it gives you the names of all the casinos they shot this movie at. So it was interesting to, to read that and to notice that they didn't just use one casino for all the casinos in the movie. So who directed this? And what was the purpose of this movie? Did it show anywhere? This movie was actually directed by a guy named John Goodall. And John Goodall died in 2004. He had a career of, I guess, documentaries, although only one of them is listed on IMDb. IMDb only has two credits for him, this movie and another documentary called Always a New Beginning. And that was actually Oscar nominated in 1974. I was able to find an obituary for him um, when he died in 2004. And there was a lot of information about him on there. And his children said that he spent his life making documentaries. Although I, IMDb only has this movie and the other li one listed. I think I also read that he did a lot of industrial films and maybe commercials. So I guess that's where most of his work was. And I guess this was his only narrative piece. I don't know where this would have shown. I can't find any records of this movie under its original title, The Jackpot. I wonder if this had a regional run, if it was shown on TV. I don't know. I can't find any information about it, and I would love to learn more about it. I try to look up the DP on this movie. It's not on IMDb when you go through the cast and crew of the IMDb page, but I did look up the name on there to see if maybe the DP was associated with other movies. Couldn't find anything. It could have been a pseudonym for uh, John Goodall, certainly, because he was a camera guy and he did industrial films and such, but I guess we'll never know. Yeah. Well, Joe's got the lie detector. You mean the voice stress analyzer? Whatever you call it. Yeah, the voice analyzer. Anyway, Joe's going to tape some guy's voice on a regular tape deck and then put it on the voice analyzer later. Will that work? Sure. Any good recording will do. Now, although there's a bunch of unknowns in this film, the cast... Much of the cast were in other projects. One of them, I think The Devil, did the narration for the director's previous documentary. But the biggest name in this movie is Warren Frost, who was in Twin Peaks. So I noticed a few reviews online kind of mentioned that they sought after this movie because of that actor in Twin Peaks. So, But yeah, there were a few others in this movie that were in other movies. So somehow they found their way into, the <laughs> into this uh, mysterious little movie that never really wound up anywhere. I should mention that there is another VHS cover of this. Uh, for years, I didn't even know this until I was doing research on this for uh, for this review. And the other one has a woman with cleavage, an Asian woman with cleavage, with a pentagram on her hand. Again, not relevant to this movie at all. So I find it interesting that, you know, Regal wasn't the only one trying to jip people. <laughs> this other distributor tried to do the same thing, so... Um it just follows the legacy of this movie. So there it is, guys. Satan's Touch. Would I recommend this movie? Absolutely not. Especially if you like horror movies. This is not a good movie by any means. I feel like the director wanted to make his first narrative movie and he just put too much into it and it just became a sloppy mess. And I guess he tried to put some moral tale into it and it just didn't follow through so um, horror fan or not you're not going to enjoy this movie it just has all kinds of issues even if you like some of the actors in this movie which are very small but a few of them do have a, um, a filmography you're, you're just not going to enjoy it so um, so no I wouldn't recommend it but if you are a VHS collector you might have this in your collection because you collect all the regals or you love the cover art or just on the basis that it's so different, the cover art is and the packaging and the description are so different than what the movie actually is. To me, that's intriguing. And that's one of the reasons I would have it in my collection, just because um, Regal had the balls to just lie to their, to their uh, customers, I guess, or to the video store patrons. I just find that incredibly fascinating for some reason. So yeah, this has been Paul with VHSCollector.com. Check out our our Indiegogo campaign that we have going on right now for the funding of VHSCollector.com. Pretty important project and I've been working on it for a long time so if you're interested in preserving a piece of cultural history please check out the link and maybe you'll contribute to that and look forward to more VHS reviews, more v, um, Blu-ray reviews. We have a lot more coming so thanks for watching. See you guys next time. When the crap game world is singing a Snake Eyes song. If you got one friend who'll be there with you, right or wrong, take it from me, take it from me. If you hit the 
Jack 